history of our lectures, this is probably the, one of the nicest February evenings we've had, so uh, cold but nice and clear. Um, Larry, our President Larry Doey, doesn't uh, appear to be able to make it tonight. Uh, I'm Terry Bishop Sterling, I'm a member of the Executive and past president, past past, maybe three pasts. Um, so, um, before I turn it over to our talk tonight, uh, we're back here next month when Marie Wadden will be speaking on the Battle Harbor Minister, so uh, another good Labrador topic, so hope to see you back uh, for that. Um, this, these lectures are free, um, there, you may have noticed a donation box out there, but what we would really like is, is if you are not a member, to take out a membership. Uh, membership in the Historical Society is $40 a year. Um, in addition to supporting all the work that we do, um, you also get the Newfoundland Quarterly for that. Now, a subscription to the Newfoundland Quarterly is $30. So for an extra 10, it really does help us out um, to as they make, keep making these lectures uh, free to the public. Um, tonight, uh, I'm going to turn things over now to John Joy, who is going to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. Good evening everyone, uh, my name is John Joy and uh, I'm the co-chair with Chris Curran of the SS Daisy Legal History Committee of the Law Society. And uh, Gus and Chris Curran have edited what I believe is the 12th Daisy Committee publication concerning the journals of George Sims, JP, and the records of the Labrador Court 1826 to 1833 as you can see from the first slide. Uh, the DAISY Committee, among its duties, not only publishes books, and they're available for viewing and purchase outside. We can only take either cash or a check, but there is an ATM machine uh, just at your elbow, next to the table there, and I'm sure that the appropriate, the, 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 is it four or five big banks here will, will certainly make sure that you have plenty of cash in your hand if, if you want to, want to buy out the entire run. But, but we also have an oral history project where we conduct interviews on judges and lawyers and other people involved in the justice system. We transcribe those and we're keeping them as an archive for future purposes. And we've also done some dramatic presentations on a number of famous cases, including where, where Peter Cashin was sued for libel for slandering the, the entire Supreme Court bench. Uh, and a case that he won, I might add. And that, and not that he proved the truth of the matter uh, of venue, who was a jury and the jury acquitted him. And, and we also did a, a dramatic reading of the case of Curry and McDonald, where most of the Newfoundland bar uh, attempted and failed to set aside the results of the Confederation referendum. We intend later this year to do a dr dramatic presentation of the 1926. Labrador boundary case, and we've recruited a couple of lawyers to argue it, and we're going to have uh, a panel of uh, privy councillors recruited from our, our latest bar admission course, and uh, that's how we're planning to do it so far, and we, we hope to be able to do that either late in May or sometime in June. We'll let you know when, when that is. Well, we have Gus Lilly here. He's, he is a, as he, he kept uh, reminding me, uh, not the, but a great-great-grandson of George Sims, the subject of this lecture tonight, and it's my pleasure to introduce him. Gus was born in St. John's, and he went to school at St. Bonaventure's College and then at Brother Rice. He's a graduate of Memorial University in English Language and Literature. He's a Rhodes Scholar. He won the Rhodes Scholarship. I think two well, years. Well, uh, 1971. Three years before your brother. You're right. 19, he got it in 1971, I think, and uh, Bill Bishop got it in 1972. Catholic Protestant. Robert Joy got it in 1973. Catholic. So that's how it went. Yeah. And and uh, and uh, Gus uh, is a graduate of Oxford University in jurisprudence and civil law. His interest in projects such as the Sims uh, journals was not only because of his family connection, but also because of a number of summers he spent studying with Drs. Herbert Halpert and, uh, and doing work, I should say, Dr. Herbert Halpert and for George Story, typing folklore materials and also tracking down word usage, contributing to the Christmas mummer in, in Newfoundland and also Dictionary of Newfoundland uh, English. At Oxford, he assisted 
Herbert Hart, a professor of jurisprudence and the author of a well-known legal book called The Concept of Law, and he was tracking down obscure literary references in Jeremy Bentham's publication for one of Professor Hart's books on Bentham. So Gus has studied legal history as an undergraduate and as a, also as a graduate in the Oxford, at Oxford University. When he was admitted to the bar, he practiced principally administrative and labor law at Stuart McKelvey and his predecessors, what we always think of being as Sterling Ryan, until he, from 1976 until he retired in 2009. And he appeared at all federal and provincial tribunal and court levels in Canada. He's a ben he was a venture of the Law Society and he served at, at, at the position that is now known as the President of the Law Society. He was a research assistant for the Newfoundland Labrador Court of Appeal during the federal and provincial dispute over the jurisdiction of the continental shelf. And again, and I repeat, that he is a great, great, great grandson of George Sims JP and has done an incredible amount of work together with Chris Curran to prepare the DAISY Committee's latest publication, including writing on his own an extensive introduction to this two volume work. I turn the podium over now to Gus Lilly and his great, great, great grandfather, George Sims Cherry <laughs> Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here. And, um, and I've been called upon to speak by many judges over my 30 odd years of practice, but never so pleasantly and, and, and flatteringly as, as, uh, as John did tonight, so thank you very much. <laughs> um, John mentioned the, uh, the Rhodes Scholarship, uh, and of course back in those days, and it's true, you did alternate Catholic and Protestant and so on, uh, and, uh, but I can remember, because I sat on the committee for a number of years afterwards, a very, very senior Rhodes Scholar of the Catholic Persuasion came up to me and said, Mr. Lilly, you, you might want to consider whether you shouldn't be restoring the balance. I don't see enough Catholics being made these days. <laughs> so, so while we did do it once, it, it, it didn't last forever. So anyway, so I'll, I'll um, as John mentioned, um, uh, George Sims was one of my 30-odd great-great-great-grandparents. Uh, and um, uh, his journals and the story that's in these journals is, is um, what, what I've come to talk to you about tonight. Um, the, uh, the lecture, of course, is the journals of George Sims, J.P. and the Labrador Court, uh, Origins, Operations, and Demise. Um, the Labrador Court was instituted in 1826 and abolished in 1834 after only eight years of operation. Each summer for two or three months, the court traveled the Labrador coast in a hired schooner, um, hearing cases in numerous coves and harbors from Eskimo Bay in what's now called Ham Hamilton Inlet uh, in the north, which is about halfway up the Labrador coast or a bit less, to Blanc Sablon in the south. The judge of the court was Captain William Patterson of the Royal Navy. Um, the Labrador court, just by way of background, was a small part of Britain's response to political agitation in St. John's in the early 1820s, when reformers were seeking a local legislature and judicial reform. The agitation was galvanized in 1820 by the floggings of Philip Butler of Harbour, Maine, and, and James Landrigan of Cupids, both planters, for contempt of the surrogate court. While Britain would not at that time concede a legislature, uh, believing that Newfoundland did not have the financial resources to support self-government, it did abolish the existing naval government and surrogacy. Uh, in, place, in place of the naval governor, who was the admiral commanding the naval station at St. John's, uh, there would be a civil governor advised by a council, and the naval station itself would be moved to Halifax. There would be an expanded Supreme Court with three judges instead of one, and two of those judges would take over the island surrogates uh, functions by conducting circuits in the northern and southern districts of the island. The Labrador Court, which we've come to speak about tonight, would replace the surrogate court which operated on the coast of Labrador from 1810 till 1822 or 23. 
Now, while the outrage that was fueled by the Butler and Landrigan cases drove debate in Parliament, um, it's likely that financial considerations played an important role in the abolition of the naval government. For it was the view in London that, but for the provision of surrogate services, there was no need to have a naval station. And it was estimated at the time that the abolition saved the Treasury £20,000 annually. So the Labrador Court, which was a small part of that larger picture, uh, that the Labrador Court dealt with civil cases only, by which we mean disputes over accounts between merchant and planter, breach of contract, trespass, debt. Uh, the judge and the clerk of the court also held commissions as justices of the peace. This enabled them to sit together as a court of two uh, to comprise what was called a court of sessions. The sessions court exercised a limited criminal jurisdiction. In practice, in Labrador, this consisted of the examination of witnesses to determine whether there was sufficient evidence to commit an accused person for trial at St. John's. Uh, the the uh, Sessions Court, the two magistrates, uh, also dealt with disputes over the wages of seamen and fishermen and set the rate to be paid for retail liquor licenses. When acting al alone, as a JP could for more limited purposes, um, in the Labrador context, the JP would conduct an inquest or um, take affidavits from witnesses for use in court, that sort of thing. So, um, before going into the journals a little bit, it may be useful to take a look at the extent of the area covered by the circuit and show how it and the court's operations evolved from the days when the Labrador coast was served by the Naval Surrogate Court. And I begin here by acknowledging the work of Richard Budgel and Michael Stavely in their essay entitled The Labrador Boundary, 1987, written to coincide with the 60th anniversary of the decision of the Privy Council in the Labrador Boundary case. Publication contains well-made maps which were specially commissioned from the Memorial University Cartography Lab, and they enhance the essay's lucid presentation of a complex story. And I do note that uh, Dr. Stavely, um, who was involved um, quite deeply in preparation of these maps and the essay itself, is here with us tonight, so it's very nice to see him. A very, very uh, useful and informative book for anybody who wants to know about the Labrador boundary dispute. But for our purpose, which is a more limited purpose, uh, the story begins in 1809. And I'll just pop you over to the next slide. This is a, um, this is a detail from one of the uh, maps that um, Dr. Stavely has in the Labrador boundary, uh, and it, um, it, um, it shows us the um, coast as, as, um, as the British government dealt with it when it divided Labrador between Lower Canada and Newfoundland in 1825. Um, but before getting into that, I should say that in 1809, uh, Britain re-annexed the coast of Labrador from the government of Lower Canada to the government of Newfoundland, thereby restoring the arrangement made in 1763 after Britain acquired Labrador from France under the Treaty of Paris. This state of affairs continued until 1825 when Britain, under pressure from Lower Canada, restored to it part of the Labrador coast along the north shore of the St. Lawrence River, and you can, you can see it there. To divide the Labrador coast between those two governments, it was necessary for Britain to establish a southern boundary. In other words, to mark off the coast of Labrador that was going to be transferred back to Lower Canada. Um, the western boundary had already been set by the, um, at the uh, River St. John, which you can see there where the, uh, where the red light is, is showing. Um, so it was necessary for the British government to set <coughs> A southern boundary for Labrador uh, to extend over to the River St. John. And the result was that under the legislation of 1825, the British North America Act, Senor, Sen, British North America Seniorial Rights Act of 1825, Britain reannexed the Lower Canada, and I'm going to quote from the Act, so much of the said coast, that's the coast there, so much of the said coast as lies to the westward of a line to be drawn due north and south north and south from Blanc to Blanc, inclusive as far as the 52nd degree of latitude. 
52nd degree of north latitude with the island of Anticosti right there and all other islands adjacent to such part as last aforesaid of the coast of Labrador. The rest of the coast of Labrador was to be left to Newfoundland. Now when Canada and Newfoundland argued their case before the Privy Council in the Labrador boundary dispute, Canada took the position that while Newfoundland was entitled to the coast of Labrador, where Newfoundland running down, whereas Newfoundland was entitled to the uh, coast of Labrador, the coast extended inland only a mile or so from the water. Enough land to prosecute a fishery. And it was the line drawn due north and south from the 52nd degree of latitude, penetrating some 40 miles uh, in, inland from Long Blanc Bay, and in some parts, as you can see, covering a much bigger distance, 100 miles and more, uh, from the sea that the Privy Council found to be, and I'm quoting from the Privy Council's decision, perhaps the strongest argument in favor of an extended construction of the grant of the Labrador coast to Newfoundland, because it pointed directly to the inference that the expression coasts of Labrador, as used in 1763 when the initial grant was um, uh, made to Newfoundland, and 1809, was understood by Parliament in 1825 to have comprised the interior of the country back to those limits. So in other words, if Quebec was going to be a coast of Labrador, pardon me, Lower Canada was going to be a coast of Labrador that was 40, 60, 80, 100 miles in from the, from the water, then Newfoundland's Labrador certainly would not be limited to a mile at the coast. And that was the key, that was the key interpretive um, feature of the uh, Labrador boundary decision in 1927. Um, now, although the territory assigned to the Labrador court was smaller than that covered by the surrogates, because, of course, the surrogates, uh, surrogates from 1809 to 1825 had all this coast down here, all the whole coast of Labrador, uh, all the way down to the River St. John, including Anticosti Island. So the Labrador court that we're dealing with had a smaller coast to deal with. But although that territory that was assigned to the Labrador Court was smaller than the surrogates territory, it was nonetheless vast. The Labrador Court visited numerous small coves and harbors. And um, I've brought along a map. Uh, these maps are, are the greatest, unfortunately, but this is the map issued by the Newfoundland government. Quite a nice modern uh, map, one, one to a million, uh, and um, quite a lot of detail on it. And on that map, uh, I have indicated uh, various places on the coast where the Labrador court visited to hold court. Not visited for reason of weather or things like that, but just visited to hold court. Uh, and they're all marked in red on the map as you see it there. And of course the, the original is sitting there in the east in front of you. But of course that doesn't come out very well on a slide. Uh, so what I, what I did was um, took a couple of pictures of it which come out a little bit better. Here's a, here's a blow up of um, Here's a blow up of the Lake Melville area, which in those days was called um, Eskimo Bay. And so you can see, get an idea of some of the places that the court traveled. Again, oops, sorry. again, there is there is Eskimo Bay or Hamilton Inlet, Lake Melville area, deep in, deep into the heart of Labrador from the from the Labrador Sea. And then you see there's your blow up of it. And, in there, in that area, the court sat at Rigolet. That was, the, that was the very first place the Labrador court ever sat, Rigolet, in Eskimo Bay. Um, Rigolet was the headquarters of the La Bay des Esquimaux, an extensive establishment owned by lower Canadian interests from Quebec. They were engaged in furring, the salmon and cod fisheries, mercantile trade with the inhabitants, with five establishments in addition to Rigolet. Three on the shores of Eskimo Bay, one right there around the northern bay, right there. Um, one at Kinemish, another one at Northwest Brook, which I'll come back to in a minute. And one on the coast near modern day Coastville, far, far up beyond where the map goes, quite a, quite a big distance up uh, on the map, right, right up near where modern day Coastville, um, Coastville is. That was the La Bay des Eskimo establishment. Quite a large, quite a large operation owned by interests from Lower Canada, in particular, the city of Quebec. Then there was Kinemish, court went to Kinemish, in Carter Basin, deep in, in, in uh, to the west in Eskimo Bay. That was the site of two rival salmon fishing establishments. 
One was the um, part of the Vegas, uh, La Vegas Eskimo uh, establishment, and the other was owned by Joseph Byrd of Sturminster Newton in Dorset, and later a pool. It, of course, was also the, the um, site of a piece of litigation that led the, Lat the Labrador Court went there to deal with piece of litigation uh, over the two rival fisheries. That was one of the features that the Privy Council found to establish Newfoundland's administrative control of Labrador in those days. Um, you have Northwest Brook, which is right here. Court visited there to do work just, just across from, uh, from Kinemish. So those are the areas in Eskimo Bay where the, where the court traveled. The next slide is, is a little bit harder to follow, but it shows you, it's, it's, it's this part of the, uh, it's this part of the uh, original map, but it takes you from the mouth of Eskimo Bay all the way down the coast of Labrador, all the way down to uh, the Straits of Belle Isle, to Moss of Law, Forto. And all of these areas, the Labrador court uh, visited um, from each year uh, as part of its, uh, as part of its uh, circuit. So you have Indian Island, I'll find Indian Island, right up here, right up there in the top, Indian Island on the north side of Eskimo Bay. That was the name of it, because there was also an Indian Island on the south side of Eskimo Bay. So Indian Island, north side of Eskimo Bay, sometimes you hear it called Indian Island Point de Nord. Um, that was the site of um, two establishments. One was a cod fishing establishment set up by Charles Cousins of Brigus, in 1826, employing 25 hands, and another was operated by La Bay des Eskimo establishment. They were they were more or less everywhere in that part of uh, of Labrador in those days. Then you have Top Harbor right here, a little bit further down. Top Harbor at the entrance of Eskimo Bay. Now, Top Harbor was the turning point for sailing vessels that were proceeding into Eskimo Bay from the south. And it was the site of an establishment owned by Joseph Byrd, who also owned the establishment down in Kinemish, uh, which Byrd relocated to Sea Lodge in 1835 because Tob wasn't a particularly good fishing area. Um, next, uh, next one that I'll mention is um, Dumplin Island. Dumplin Island right here. Uh, Dumplin Island at the mouth of Sandwich Bay. Uh, there, there you see Sandwich Bay there. Uh, where Baird and Company, later Hunt and Company, uh, Hunt and Henley, Henley after that, of course, of Dartmouth, had a considerable cod fishing establishment, employing many persons, and it was also headquarters, the Dumplin Bay, uh, was headquarters for uh, Hunt, uh, Beard and Hunt's um, salmon fisheries at the Eagle, Paradise, and White Bear Rivers, very lucrative salmon fisheries in there, and of course, still well known salmon fishing grounds today. Um, Brady Harbor, Farther down, Grady Island, Grady Harbor, a little bit farther down the coast. That was a central location for court business coming in from nearby islands, islands all around it. Uh, Long Island, Ground Island, Black Island, Southeast Cove. Grady was the site of establishments owned by Joseph Soper, later Soper and Sons, of Plymouth in England and Harbor Grace, and Wise Baker and Howard of Shaldon and Devon, with premises on the south side in St. John's. So you can see, uh, you can see the merchant, the mercantile activity in the islands on the uh, on the coast. The Indian Tickle, right there, coming down the coast. The principal establishments there, there were two of them. One was Codner and Company with premises on Water Street and St. John's, and Matthew Warren from Tainmouth uh, and St. John's. Venison Island, uh, further down again, right here, Venison Island, uh, with slaves. Uh, Slade and Company, Slade Brothers, carried on an extensive mercantile business prior to 1826, which was later reduced to a fishery carried on by Felix McCarthy of Carboneer with 18 hands. Battle Harbor, of course, the famous um, Slade's property, a central location for court business from a number of different harbors and coves in the area, Sizes Harbor, Cape Charles, Matthews Cove. Cape Charles, south again. Um, where Wise Baker and Howard had the principal establishment. Camp Islands, down farther south again, I'm not sure I'm hitting on them, but I'm trying to. Uh, they were called the Scamp Islands by Sims sometimes. That was where Thomas Penn of Mosquito, now Bristol's Hope in Conception Bay, had a, an establishment. And Forto, right in the south, right down there, Forto, uh, in the south, uh, the most considerable British establishment in the Straits of Belle Isle, with three Three establishments from Jersey, and of course uh, Joseph Byrd at the fourth establishment there. So all of these, um, 
all of these areas, and there, and there are more, I just have only gone through a number of them, all of these uh, brief descriptions of the locations where the Labrador Court visited to hold sessions are taken from the journal or from the court records or from other contemporary sources. Some mercantile establishments, as you've seen, were British, some were Newfoundland, some were Canadian. The Labrador Court followed the fishery and had little or no interaction with Inuit or other indigenous peoples on the coast, and it provided no services to the Moravian missions. Now, considering the size of the area covered by the court, the records disclose that the court did relatively little business. Part of the reason for this is that most persons who were engaged in the fishery on the coast came from a home port on the island, and such disputes as they had tended to arise after the close of the fishing season when they returned home to settle accounts with their suppliers. To a large extent, the Labrador court was engaged when a dispute involved persons or property resident or located on the coast, or involved a British or other establishment with no connection to the island, or involved transients from Nova Scotia and other colonies who had no recourse to the island's courts. And of course, I mentioned to you uh, the dispute between um, Bird and the proprietor of La Beda's Eskimo. These were, this was done in the Labrador court, settled in the end, but these were people who had no connection with Newfoundland, more convenient to use the Labrador court. Um, but of course, um, whether uh, persons engaged in commerce in, in this part of the world um, used the Labrador court sometimes depended on circumstances, even though they may have had property there. For instance, when a major dispute arose over the purchase and sale of La Bede's Eskimo establishment in 1829, the, court, the case was brought not in the Labrador Court or in the Supreme Court of Newfoundland, but in Lower Canada, before the Court of King's Bench in Quebec. The Labrador Court had no involvement, except that the Lower Canadian Court issued a commission to the judge to examine witnesses in the cause who were located in Eskimo Bay. Not being part of the Labrador Court's function, of course, that commission did not find its way into the court's records, and it only came to light through the Sims Journal. Um, the case, so the cases that came before the Labrador Court typically produced brief notices in the records, and, and, but they're valuable for the dating and location of commercial premises, merchants, planters, and others engaged in the fishery. And although the court went almost everywhere on the Labrador coast, roughly speaking, south of Cape Harrison, it left little mark, uh, left little mark. Its records have survived, at least that part of them in which the daily proceedings of the court were minuted by the clerk, and occasionally after its demise in 1834, the court we mentioned, when someone was looking to have judicial services restored on the coast, but otherwise there was little or no memory of the old Labrador court. But then surprisingly, along came Lambert de Boisleau, in his entertaining and well-regarded recollections of Labrador life, 1861, that's the title page from the, uh, from the book, um, giving a contemporary vignette of the Labrador court. Writing, de Boileau writes humorously of an inebriated judge, gloriously unaware of his surroundings, <laughs> and stumbling through a docket of petty lawsuits. Now I'll let de Boileau give his recollection. This is a quote from, uh, from this book. In September, we generally had a visit from a surrogate magistrate in a schooner. But this is done away with. In fact, it was a mere farce of a court. The judge was a retired post captain in the Navy, and the court was held on board a schooner hired for the purpose. It frequently happened that the judge got drunk. And then the scene in court was richer than anything in Pickwick. All the early day, there sits his honor so consumedly drunk as to be scarcely enabled to distinguish any of the parties about him. And after an hour or two sitting, he abruptly settles all the cases, telling the crier to adjourn the court to the next harbor at 10 the following morning. Such was the only court we had to deal with, and glad I was when I learned it was done away, for such a mockery of justice was calculated to bring both the British crown and the British flag into contempt. So, one's initial reaction would be to wonder whether this is just a piece of fiction, another take on the drunken judge, uh, in the same vein as Krauss's later depiction of the fictional fishing admiral. You'll recall the fishing admiral who was seated on the inverted butter curtain, then prostrate on the floor, overcome by the two potent effects of new rum and spruce beer. But 
But the recent publication by the Law Society of the journals of George Sims, JP, and the records of the Labrador Court puts pay to the notion of fiction. Uh, Sims, uh, the author of the journals, Sims was the clerk of the Labrador Court and Justice of the Peace for Labrador. In his previously unpublished journals, he gives an account of the struggle that the court's judge, Captain Patterson, had with alcoholism and the impact of this on the administration of justice on the coast. And corroboration for Sims's um, uh, account may be found in the papers of Governor Copper. So four of Sims journals are known to have survived. Those from 1830 to 1833. The journals for 1830 and 1833 are complete. Those for 1831 and 32 survive only in part. It is not known whether Sims kept journals in other years. The journals give in diary form uh, Sims's observations on what he saw and did from the time the court left St. John's until it returned. These journals have been in my possession for over 40 years. My aunt, Jean Peters, who was my father's sister, gave them to me in the early 1970s when I was a student. She acquired them from her aunt, Elizabeth Steed, who was her mother's sister and a great-granddaughter of George Sims. And, and as John has pointed out, uh, it was Chris Curran of the Law Society's S.S. Daisy Legal History Committee who suggested that the journals might warrant publication by the Law Society along with the court records, put the two side by side, which I think was a good idea. The court records, of course, <coughs> consist of two volumes, <coughs> one for the Labrador Court, which is the Civil Court, for the years 1826 to 1833, and the other for the Sessions Court, that's the court where the two Justices of the Peace sit together. Uh, and those exist for the years 1827 to 1832. There are no Sessions Court records for 1826 and 1833. And the originals of these records are held in the provincial archives at the rooms. And I should say that it would have been impossible to complete this work and the work that John referred to in his, in his introduction without access to the extensive holdings of the provincial archives at the rooms and at the Center for Newfoundland Studies at Memorial University. We are blessed with, a, with a, 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 an abundance of archival material in the province. And George Sims, the author, um, was born in Birmingham, England in 1794, one of 12 children of William and Mary Sims. No less than five of the Sims children emigrated to Newfoundland in the early years of the 19th century. Apart from his time with the Labrador Court, Sims spent his whole adult life in Trapassi, where he was a merchant, dying there in 1867. It is not known exactly when Sims came to Newfoundland, but a copy of a letter of his to Lloyds of London written in 1853, which survived with his journals, tells that he assisted the survivors of the ship Neptune, wrecked in St. Mary's Bay in May 1815. From 1815 to 22, Sims provided assistance to the survivors of five shipwrecks, and of course to many more in the years after. Um, Sims married Cap Catherine Burke of Trapassi, uh, a native of Trapassi, in 1823, and he became Justice of the Peace for the Southern District in 1826. He and his wife raised a family of 11 children. Among them, they counted a magistrate at Grand Bank, an auctioneer at St. John's, and a merchant in Chicago, Illinois. Their eldest daughter married Robert Carter of Farragut, who was the eldest son of Robert Carter, who was for many years a merchant at J.P. at Farragut, and a diarist, whose journals and court records were published by the Law Society a few years back. So Sims's journals provide insight into the Labrador of nearly 200 years ago. Sims's contact with people was not limited to the somewhat formal setting of a court. He was often on shore, taking tea, hiking, buying things to bring home, hunting and fishing with his colleagues. Also the nature of his work, which included the collection of a form of tax called the Greenwich Hospital Dues, brought him into the premises of all the principal merchants along the coast. He made friends easily. In 1832, Sims wrote that the Roman Catholic priest, Father Charles Dalton of Harbor Grace, who was on the coast to minister to his flock, and a quote from the journal, made me a present of a pair of Indian boots, and he would not take for no an answer, and he would not take no for an answer until I accepted of a silk handkerchief as a token of his friendship. The same year at Brady Harbor, where Joseph Soper had an establishment, Sims tells how he obtained a law book 
my friend, Mr. William Sober, that's a son of Joseph, presented me with an epitome of, Bla of Blackstone's commentaries. I must endeavor next year to pick up something for him in return for his good-natured conduct to me on all occasions. Consequently, Sims, mentions, and places, merchants, traders, agents, aboriginal inhabitants, inhab inhabitations, vessels, the state of the fishery, the presence of foreign fishing vessels. He identifies and gives prices for furs and items that were made and sold by native craftspersons on the coast, and for items traded by sea captains, arriving not only from Britain, but also from France and Russia, including a wide variety of spirits and wines. I went on board the Venus, he wrote, and purchased a quarter cask of Mount Etna Madeira from the captain. The wine is excellent, and I purchased it a bargain, save four pounds, ten shillings. <coughs> Strange place to meet with wine of this description. Now, Mount Etna Madeira was a Sicilian wine, similar in taste to, but cheaper than Portuguese Madeira. Marine life was plentiful in the waters near Hamilton Inlet, or Eskimo Bay. We occasionally pass by large shoals of seals sporting in the water that have quite the appearance of running a race, Sims wrote on one occasion. On another, the weather is beautifully fine, not a cloud in the sky. The water is smooth as possible, and hundreds of whales, grampuses, and seals to be seen dashing in the water in all directions. Then a sea battle. Today, witness several attacks of swordfish and sharks on several whales. The latter often jumped perpendicularly out of the water, uttering a loud and I may, and I may add, tremendous bawl. But the coast could also be treacherous, as Sims describes in 1833 at Dompanado. There's a little picture of Dompanado. Um, it blew a most perfect gale the whole of last night and today with continued rain, sleet, and hailstones much more like the middle of December than the 2nd of September. I quite expect to hear of a many losses. Fortunately for us, we are in good anchorage. See, whoops. Oops. Oh, really going ahead. You can see that the, uh, quite a nice little spot to pull in. Uh, fortunately, um, we are in good anchorage, but in exposed places, a many losses will occur. The squalls throw our craft almost chains in the water, so much for Labrador weather. A few years later, in 1829, at the Seal Islands, the court's vessel lost four crew members when they went three miles from the vessel in a small boat to get water. Sims recorded the event in the session's records. The wind was then blowing a fresh gale at the southeast. On the return towards the vessel, the wind in an instant changed to the northwest, blew a perfect hurricane, when unfortunately the boat upset and all on board perished. The court visited the Moravian Mission at Hopedale in August 1830. Sims was dubious about the visit, as it took the court so far away from its circuit, quite far up the coast to the north, and Patterson wanted to go even farther north to Nain. What our Newfoundland friends will say, Sims wrote, to our proceedings is not very difficult to tell. For my part, I expect we shall be tried by a court-martial and all set adrift. But, but he was soon quite happy, marveling at the gardens. And there you see a view of Hopedale in 1827, kindly provided by Dr. Hans Roman at Memorial University, uh, which is an interesting view of Hopedale from the Moravian Mission newsletter, um, because it shows Hopedale as it existed when Sims and the court saw it in 1830, <coughs> before changes were made in the late 19th century. So this is the, this is the Hopedale as it existed in the, in the um, 18, um, 1830. And over there, I think that's number 13, that's where the gardens were, vegetables and flowers and that sort of thing. They called it the Brothers' Kitchen Garden. Now, since <coughs> journals record or recount this uh, visit to, the, to, to Hopedale, and, and they enumerate a variety, the, the variety of vegetables and flowers grown by the missionaries. Now, I'll just quote from the, from, the, um, from the journal, because he gives a great list of the sorts of of um, flowers and vegetables that the missionaries were able to produce in Hopedale in 1830. Cabbages of all sorts, lettuce, radishes, cauliflower, red and white beet, carrots and potatoes, all in a much more forward state than generally in Newfoundland at the same period. But their flower gardens surpass everything that I could have fancied. At the moment I am writing, they have the following in the greatest perfection. Wallflower, monthly rose, 
auriculas, double and single, stalks, double and single, geraniums in full bloom, larkspur, china aster, sweet pea, forget-me-not, convolvulus major and minor, and balsams. To see flowers in such perfection in a climate where the thermometer is often 40 under zero a Fahrenheit with a nine months winter seems almost like an exaggeration, but it is an absolute fact. So Sims was quite, uh, quite impressed with the, um, with, the, uh, with the gardens at Hopedale. Now thanks to, um, thanks to Chief Justice Richard Tucker of the Supreme Court, the Labrador Court enjoyed an advantage over its, the predecessor surrogate court. The surrogates relied for clerical support on personnel from their own vessels, whereas the Labrador judge was supported by a clerk who was, on Tucker's recommendation, quote, quoting from Tucker, well acquainted with the court of proceeding, with the course of proceeding usually followed in the course of Newfoundland, as well as with many of the customs and usages of the fisher. Now, as the timely settlement of fisher-related disputes was central to the Labrador court's mandate, the presence of an experienced clerk was considered <coughs> critical. And all of the court's initial group of officers were recommended for the positions by Tucker, who vouched for the ability of each one. The court's first clerk, James Blakey, was an experienced clerk of the Supreme Court and police magistrate for St. John's, who was loaned to the court for its first circuit. Sims didn't go as clerk of the court until the second circuit in 1827. Now, who cannot see Blakey's experience with self-effacing hand in the extemporaneous oral summation and moderately complex judgment of the court recorded as being given at Mullins Cove in the case of John Jordan against Codner and Tracy and George Squires. In that case, Patterson upheld the plaintiff's claim for forcible break and entry and removal of fish from the plaintiff's store. But instead of awarding the £50 claimed, he awarded a paltry 10 shillings, pointing to the defect for the plaintiff's fraudulent connivance in attempting to defeat the defendant's rights under Newfoundland's customary law of current supply. So there you see the value of having, uh, of having a knowledgeable clerk in the court. But no doubt, it's not Sims, the clerk, but Patterson himself we hear in the judgment in Peter Furlong against John Brown, given at Henley Harbor in 1828. There the plaintiff claimed 79 pounds, 6 shillings. The evidence was clear cut. The defendant forcibly removed goods from the plaintiff's schooner, threatened to cut the vessel adrift and blow out the brains of the crew if they did not give him what he wanted. He said he would blow out the owner's brains too if he had them on board. <laughs> Sims, Sims wrote. His Honor the judge in addressing the defendant said it was the most outrageous case that had ever come before him. Had the defendant been in England, the least punishment would have been transportation for life. And in all probability he would have been more severely punished, perhaps with death. Under all the circumstances of the case, he should give the plaintiff judgment for the full amount sued for. Mm -hmm. Patterson seems to have believed in the therapeutic effect of a, of a good fright. Mm -hmm. Now, the first two sheriffs of the court, William Dixon and Brian <coughs> Robinson, were both lawyers. Robinson later became a Supreme Court judge. The third sheriff, Elias Rendell, was sergeant at arms of the House of Assembly and went back to Labrador in 1840 to collect customs duties. He filed a report calling for the restoration of the Labrador court and conducted the census of the resident population. Thomas Morton seems to have been one of those marvelous bailiffs, familiar to many lawyers, who could turn his hand to anything. Sims's journals and the court records depict Morton at different times as piloting the governor's yacht from Indian Tickle to Duncan Island, giving expert testimony before the court as a fish caller at Mullins Cove, and representing a litigant before the court at Battle Harbor all demanding occupations and all carried on successfully by the court's bailiff. <laughs> the other bailiff, Robert Andrews, must have been a character who enjoyed his meals better than divine service. For, for Sims gives this account of a running Andrews had with Patterson at Indian Tickle. Here, this is Sims. A funny scene took place this morning between Andrews and his honor about some herring. The latter threatening to put the former under arrest for nothing and frequently making use of the following very pretty expression for a judge, and please forgive me. Damn your soul, you scoundrel. You think a damn deal more of your damned infernal guts by a damn deal than you do of your God. That I know by God. <laughs> this, Sims continues, this was Sunday morning. And oh, what a disgrace to expose himself to be laughed at day after day in such a disreputable way. But he will never mend. 
Next day, Patterson officiated as parson at a funeral. <laughs> now the court, the court um, was supported, aside from its officers, was supported by a contingent of half a dozen armed soldiers from the garrison in St. John's, who provided security, ensured that the court's orders were uh, obeyed, and assi assisted in the apprehension of suspected criminals. For the last six circuits, the uh, circuit vessel was the schooner Belinda, a 67-foot, 109-ton, ice-reinforced sealing and trading vessel, built at Belle Island in Conception Bay, and captained by William Pitts of Belle Island. To complete the picture, the Belinda mounted a three-pounder gun in her day. There were no lawyers following this court. The distance from St. John's was immense, 500 miles, and the value of the business was not great. Most litigants <coughs> represented themselves, although one plaintiff at Southeast Cove retained the Belinda's mate to recover eight pounds, 16 shillings under a promissory note. The merchant houses appeared in court through their agents and clerks. The judge, Captain William Patterson came from a wealthy Scottish family. His father, George, who was a physician and son of a master weaver from Dundee, made a fortune in India in the early 1770s, a diplomatic advisor to the Nawab of Arcot, a British ally. He returned to Scotland and married the Honorable Anne Gray, daughter of Charles Gray, 12th Baron Gray of Castle Kinfons, whose title can be traced back to the early 15th century. George purchased and restored the Gray's old family home, which had gone out of the family, and gave it back his original name of Castle Huntley. There, George and Anne raised a family of ten children. William was the fifth son, born in 1783. Like many younger sons of well-connected families, he joined the Royal Navy, where he served for twenty years. Patterson saw action in the Napoleonic Wars under the command of Admiral Sir Alexander Cochrane, Commander-in-Chief West Indies, whom he, whom he described later in life as his patron. Also serving under Admiral Cochrane was Cochrane's son, Thomas, the future governor of Newfoundland. Patterson and young Cochrane shipped together for a time in 1805 when they were young lieutenants. There we have a picture of Sir Thomas Cochrane, um, an early picture, portrait of him, um, done in 1812 by um, George Englehart, September 1812, shortly after Cochrane's marriage and investiture as a knight. Uh, you see him there in the, in the uniform of a Royal Navy captain. And this is roughly about, the, about how Cochrane, I guess, would have looked when he, when he, uh, when he was governor here in Newfoundland and, um, and when he formed his friendship with, uh, with William Patterson. Quite different, I think, from the very distinguished, handsome, um, silver here, full admiral you see staring at you in government house. Quite a different person. This is, this is the young Thomas Cochran, 23 years old, captain in the Royal Navy. So he was, um, he served under his father as well in the, uh, in the, in the West Indies. Um, and, and as I said, the, both of these two young officers shipped together on the, on the same boat, uh, the same vessel in 1805. Shortly after, Patterson transferred to Sir, Ale Sir Alexander's flagship and saw heavy action at the Battle of St. Domingo in 1806, where he commanded the flagship's main deck. The vessel lost 21 killed and 79 wounded. Now, at that time, uh, Patterson would have been... Uh, would have been... Um, 23. Uh, he commanded the flagship's main deck, and around him, 21 were killed and 79 wounded. He married Sarah Wills Brissett in Jamaica in 1809, advanced quickly in rank until he made captain in 1810 at the age of 27. Patterson evacuated Bourbon loyalists to England during the hundred days of Napoleon's escape from Elba in 1815, and later participated in the blockade of the French coast to prevent Napoleon's escape to the West Indies. He was decorated for his role as commander of a 74-gun man of war in the Battle of Algiers in 1816. And you can see, you can see this, um, this uh, painting of the Battle of Algiers, which is in the uh, Royal Naval Museum at Greenwich in London. Um, this painting um, was, um, was um, done by George Chambers Sr. in 1836, 20 years after the battle. A group of the captains who commanded warships 
in the battle, commissioned Chambers to paint this picture to present to their admiral, their commander-in-chief, Admiral Lord Exmouth. And the beauty of it, and why I brought it here tonight to show you, is that it, it actually gives, oops, I'm sorry, it actually gives um, perfect view of Captain Patterson's ship. There she is, HMS Minden, 74 guns, building Bombay, solid teak. And this is the ship that Patterson commanded at the, uh, at the Battle of Algiers and received a decoration for it uh, later on in 1816. Patterson's last years of naval service were spent in India and Ceylon, where he commanded the flagship of the Commander-in-Chief, East Indies. On returning to England in 1820, he was paid off and never obtained another naval posting. Not surprising, by the way, because the Navy downsized tremendously after the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815. Out of work, Patterson fell on hard times, for he had long since spent his inheritance and hopes of money from his wife's family never materialized. Then, seemingly out of the blue, Cochrane offered him the post of Labrador judge in 1824. With no other prospects, he accepted the offer as what he called a gift from heaven, meanwhile telling Cochrane that he, that he had encountered disappointments and illness on his posting to India, and that this, along with lack of work, had ruined him. His circumstances, he said, were, quote, seriously and distressingly involved. He begged Cochrane to keep the appointment as private as he possibly could, so that it would not be known where he had gone until he had sailed. <laughs> this, this is suggestive of financial troubles and possibly more. It appears from Patterson's father's testamentary records, or testamentary papers, that Patterson's inheritance was mainly exhausted by payments to creditors, and that it was not safe to entrust him with money. <laughs> Uh, but Cochrane, Governor Cochrane, was a loyal friend to Patterson, for he followed through on the promise of an appointment, despite what must have been warning signals. Even though the appointment was his to make, Cochrane was cautious, and he raised with the colonial office the question whether the Labrador judge required legal training. But in so doing, he was firm in his support for Patterson. There was an officer of considerable standing as post captain, and who was one of the most distinguished in the command of a ship of the line in the Battle of Algiers, who has not a shilling but his half pay of 180 pounds a year to support a wife and seven children, and to whom, as far as it depends on me, I have promised that situation, if it is made in any way sufficient to support him. And I have no doubt if the office can be executed by a person not brought up to the bar, he will perform its duties with every credit to himself. Soon afterwards, um, Patterson obtained the appointment at 700 pounds a year, same salary that was paid to the uh, Supreme Court judges. Patterson left for Newfoundland uh, almost immediately thereafter with most of his family without even notifying the Admiralty that he was going. As a result, he lost his half pay for a time until he obtained retroactive approval for the posting. Patterson was on the pier in St. John's to welcome Cochrane when, he, when Cochrane arrived to take up his post as governor. At some point, either before Patterson left for Newfoundland or in, when Cochrane arrived there, Cochrane had a discussion with Patterson about his spending, and Patterson promised that he would live within his means. Unfortunately, Patterson didn't live up to this undertaking. Cochrane sent him a written admonition towards the, the end of 1827, just before he left for England for the winter. Patterson replied that he hoped that time would show that his constant efforts to attain Cochrane's object were successful. But of concern to Cochrane was Cochrane's statement, of concern to Patterson was Cochrane's statement that an informant whom Cochrane did not identify, had told him that Patterson's illness in India was the result of what Patterson called that fatal practice observed by you. The fatal practice observed by Cochrane was most likely drinking to excess. Patterson did not deny the charge of the fatal practice, but said that the charge was influenced by malice. He and Cochrane were old friends, and Patterson played on this when he wrote, I hope therefore on your return, I hope therefore on your return that you will find Wally Patterson what you once knew him. Um, the, um, there was agitation in 1828 and 1829 for the uh, abolition of the Labrador Court. Cochrane was a staunch supporter of the Labrador Court, but with experience he felt that the court could be run more cheaply than it was running uh, under the arrangement that was originally set up, uh, which suggests that um, 
perhaps he was thinking that the Labrador court should be continued, but perhaps Patterson might have to be jettisoned. And this takes us back to Sims as journals. Sims portrays Patterson as being frequently inebriated for extended periods of time, so much so that his health began to suffer. He slept for extended periods, kept to his cabin, had a fear of performing his duties, was noticeably drunk at table and on the bench, had poor physical coordination, suffered from inattentiveness and memory loss, and ate little or nothing. For example, at Henley Harbor um, in 1830, Sims records, he fell through the stage and had a thorough dip. State he was in, state he was in accounted for it. In 1831, Cochrane went on a tour of Labrador in his yacht. He met up with Patterson off the Great Northern Peninsula. Patterson was on his way to circuit. He invited Patterson on the yacht to dine. Cochrane noticed that he smelled strongly of spirits. I'd hoped that he had gotten the better of that habit, Cochrane confided to his journal. Later, Patterson went on the yacht again in a state of intoxication. Sims wrote, I think Sir Thomas gave him a lesson, his malpractice having been fully developed. Patterson sent a lamb and some lettuce on shore for Cochrane to make amends for his conduct. Fairly early in 1830, in the 1832 circuit, the Belinda's captain took possession of the keys of the spirits at Top Harbor. By the time the vessel reached Indian Tickle, nearly two weeks later, Sims wrote, the judge still carrying on the war, was totally unfit to be seen when he came to dinner. A few days later at Bateau, Sims was kept awake all night by the heavy wind and rain, and what he called the bawling and groaning of a worse than drunken beast. Just two days later, we were obliged to take away all the wine and barrels from the cabin last night, and we shall be obliged to take that in the lockers today if we intend taking his honor home alive. He is daily, nay, I might say hourly, becoming a greater drunkard. In fact, he lives altogether on suction. He never takes breakfast or tea, and very little indeed for his dinner. His memory is getting daily more impaired, and his legs will in a short time be like drumsticks. So, the, And the judge's activity was affecting the court's reputation and credibility. Our court is hourly getting more into disrepute, and I must say not without justice. The supreme head of it is to all intents and purposes irrecoverably lost to all shame and decency. So by 1833, Cochrane was determined not to send Patterson on circuit. Cochrane met with Patterson and his wife Sarah, and Sarah described the meeting as painful. Patterson was allowed to go on circuit only after making a written promise to curb his drinking, confining himself to a limited amount of wine and, quote, certainly no spirits. Sarah Patterson agreed to accompany him, to accompany him and to report to Cochrane any breach of his undertaking. But things don't appear to have gone any better. There was little business for the court that year, but what there was did not go well. We were never in so fair a way of not doing anything as this year, Sims wrote. It is quite time to make some alteration. I do not wonder at people being disgusted with our proceedings when I sicken to think of it myself. The implication, of course, is that Patterson's inebriety was driving away business. Although, on the other hand, the court's business was never very great, and the Labrador fishery was bad that year. So, when the court was abolished in 1834, that was the last circuit, 1833, when the court was abolished in 34, the reason given was that its cost exceeded the benefit it provided. There was also talk in St. John's that Britain and not Newfoundland should fund the court, as it was felt that the court served mainly commercial interests from Britain, who did not have much or any connection with the island. No public or other mention was made of the difficulties observed by Sims, despite his comments that the court's reputation suffered. No one filed a complaint, at least not one that has survived. The only mention we have of any of it is de Boileau's description of the court written some 30 years later. For his part, Cochrane remained loyal to Patterson. He sent him on eight months' leave for health after the 1833 circuit, anticipating that he might not return. He provided Patterson with a letter of reference, Patterson, with a letter of reference to the colonial office in these terms. I beg leave to recommend Captain Patterson strongly to your protection. He is a very old officer, and particularly distinguished himself in the command of a ship at the Battle of Algiers. Um, he subsequently served in the East Indies, where his health became much impaired, in which the sudden transition to this vigorous climate has by no means tended to improve. <laughs> and I regret to add that with deprivation of office will cease the sole support of a numerous and interesting family. Cochran also noted that Patterson performed the duties of acting assistant Supreme Court judge on three occasions. Patterson never obtained another colonial office appointment. He died in 1838. As for Sims, he was out of government employment for a couple of years, but came back as clerk of the Southern Circuit of the Supreme Court and registrar of deeds for the Southern District of the Island. 
his official traveling duties now limited to the Southern District, he spent time in Fairyland, which is the court seat, and along the Southern Avalon South Coast, where his duties took him to St. Mary's, Harbor Breton, Buren, Placentia, and Odeira. And although Patterson's activity was viewed negatively on the coast of Labrador, according to Sims, history has reserved an honorable place for him. And I quote, Judge Patterson exercised his functions at various places in the territory, including Rigolette, Kinemish, and Northwest Brook, places which would have been far outside his jurisdiction if it had been limited, as suggested by Canada, in this inquiry. So wrote the Privy Council in the Labrador Boundary case of 1927, when it awarded to Newfoundland the territory, which is present-day Labrador. So that in, that uh, that concludes um, that concludes my my uh, discussion of the uh, Labrador Court and, and um, what I suppose you would call as untold story. Um, but before I before I finish, though, I would like to thank the Newfoundland and Labrador Historical Society for um, extending this invitation to me, uh, to Larry Doey, the president, and to Heidi Thorn, the vice president. Heidi has been very, very helpful and welcoming throughout the process of starting up and getting ready and figuring out what to do about this. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Melvin Baker, archivist historian at Memorial University, and Robin McGraw for reading and commenting on a draft of the presentation, Dr. Michael Stavely, a former Dean of Arts and head of the Geography Department at Memorial, and Dr. Hans Rollman, an honorary research professor in religious studies at Memorial for the use of materials, and um, Mike Slaney, computer support specialist at the Marine Institute for help in setting up the visual aids for the presentation and making all of this work as, as, um, as well as it possibly could, allowing for human limitations. <laughs> and finally, to the members of the uh, Historical Society present tonight, members of the Law Society and Judiciary present tonight who have come out, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, and members of the public, they're, they're here too. Thank you very much for attending. standing member of the Newfoundland and Labrador Historical Society and it is customary and it's certainly very historical that we would call on the audience to ask questions if they would like. Do we have time for a few questions? Yeah. What time is it? It's, uh, it's uh, 25 to 9 so you're oh, no, well no. right at, Yeah. I think, I think we were under an injunction that we have to be out of the building by 9, is that it? Or, or, or no, it, uh, this is the former president saying that we can stay to midnight. <laughs> and, uh, but then, and you'll open the bar. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, who, who's going to close the bar? All right, there's, there's, there's a question from the Honorable Judge uh, Jerry Barnable. Gus, it must have been very difficult for, uh, to get assemble witnesses on the circuits down there because usually it occurred to me in the fall. And uh, that must have been part of the difficulty in actually getting much work done. Some of the cases were postponed or withdrawn because witnesses couldn't come. Sometimes, sometimes the court would send the bailiff out and the bailiff wouldn't be able to get the witness because the witness would be 20 miles away. <laughs> sometimes the weather would prevent the witness from getting in. It was quite difficult. The court, I think, as far as I can see anyway, but you are right, I mean, that would be another reason for cutting down the business of the court because the court is there during a busy season and you have the weather and the geography against you as well. No, no question about it. And the records do give examples where that sort of that sort of thing occurs. But you do find, I mean, the court did go to um, <clears throat> central areas. It, it was very, very flexible. It, the judge tried to pick areas that were accessible to surrounding areas, various different islands. Um, he would go wherever you would call him. There's record, there's examples in the records where somebody would ask the judge to come to Venice and Island. He would go. So um, he would, they would, what they would also do is as they were going up the coast, they usually started north and worked south. As they were, went up the coast to the north, they'd have to stop here and there along the way. They'd post, they'd post notices as they went along so that the merchants and, and uh, planters and fisher people would all know when the court was going to come back and when it would expect to sit. But of course the court may not have got back on that day. Weather might have prevented it. You know, you, you don't know, but still, they did the best they could. More questions? Uh, there's a question in the back there. It seems that the, the uh, cases that were tried were all civil. Were there ever any criminal 
You have, you have the Labrador Court was a civil court. The only criminal material that came, the only criminal matters that came before them were matters that came before the Sessions Court when the two judges sat together, Patterson and Sims. And those cases only involved um, uh, taking evidence for those two magistrates to determine whether there was enough evidence to send the person to court. Nowadays you might call it a preliminary inquiry, that sort of thing. Um, not, not quite like that, but that it would be one of the origins of a preliminary inquiry. So, uh, and, and what would happen is they would take the evidence, <coughs> the two magistrates would take the evidence, it would be written down, um, the accused would be there hearing what was said against him, um, and um, then the accused would be given a chance to cross-examine the witnesses. So, so what that meant was in practice that sometimes to give the accused his opportunity to cross-examine, the court would have to go from one harbor to another, bring the accused along so that he could cross-examine the witnesses. And that was the extent of the criminal activity that the court did. But once the court was satisfied that there was sufficient to commit a person for trial, and these were always murders in the Labrador case, in the Labrador court's case, once the court, and there were two of them, once the court was satisfied, then the person would be arrested you know, by the, by, the, um, by the sheriff, assisted, uh, assisted by the constables and possibly by the soldiers who were on board. The, the accused would then be brought on board, confined in the vessel, imprisoned in the vessel, and then brought back to St. John's for trial. That, that's how it would work. So, but only two cases like that. Is there a question up front? Yeah, there were, there were American fishermen operating on that coast in that same period. There were. Is there any indications of conflict with Americans that might have been brought No, forward? no, not, not, in the, not in Sims's journal, nor in the court records of the Library Court, is there any indication of any conflict with the American uh, fishing people. Um, there are numerous examples in Sims's journal in particular, um, where he, and, and, and sometimes in the court records too, where the numbers of American vessels in different parts of the coast are, are identified. Like 40 vessels at Battle Harbor or Indian Tinkle, that sort of thing. You see that, but never any dispute, never any problem. Uh, the, Americans, the Americans, of course, had the right to be on the coast under the Anglo-American Convention of 1818. That was what it gave them, that was what gave them the um, right to fish the Newfoundland coast, right from the whole west coast, right up the, right up the west coast of Newfoundland and up, up the Labrador. They had that right. Um, it was, in the, it was in the times of the surrogate courts, 18, 19, 20, that there were concerns about the Americans. They, start, they didn't start coming until 1820. In 1820, they started coming. Um, the governor of the day, Sir Charles Hamilton, sent over a, quite a good surrogate, uh, Captain Hercules Robinson, uh, and he went over and worked diligently with the locals and with the Americans, set up guidelines and so on, and, and, uh, and Hamilton indicated in his report to the Admiralty that everything worked so well that in 1820 there was only one complaint out of 600, as he said, American vessels on the coast that year. One complaint, and he expected that to be resolved amicably. So, for whatever reason, the Americans got on well, so, so, as far as the record showed. Who which, knows in real life? <laughs> which is in sharp contrast to their behavior during the period 1770-1886, during the time of George Cartwright. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. Cartwright suffered mightily at the hands of Ameri did. American did. privateers. Now, because the Americans were operating at that time well, under, that was under was letters wartime. of mark. Uh, yeah. that, that the question, there's, always a, there's always a very thin line between piracy and privateers, as, as you well yeah. know. But I mean, this 1818 convention was one of the outcomes of the War of 1812 and the settlement of that war. And this is peacetime now, and apparently things have changed. Certainly, Sir Charles Hamilton thought they worked well. Somewhere. There's one right at the back here, and then I'll come down here. Okay. Is there any indication in the records that any, <coughs> excuse me, that any of the indigenous population ever came in contact with the court? No, no. I mean, a lot of a lot of the uh, a lot of the inhabitants up in Eskimo Bay area um, uh, were intermarried, European and Inuit. Um, but you you know, if you just look at the court record, unless you had knowledge of the uh, knowledge of that. Um, you're, you're usually dealing with European names, so, so there's no way you could tell unless you had some really specialized knowledge. Certainly nothing that I ever saw uh, indicate, shows any um, indigenous person doing, having any litigation before the court. Now you do see the court, you do see the court on two occasions when it went to Oakdale, um, retaining uh, 
retaining Aboriginal pilots to take them up. Uh, for instance, uh, Patterson retained George Etiquette and Mullet to take them up to Hopedale, to pilot them up to Hopedale. And Mullet was what was called an Indian. Uh, and um, when they got to Hopedale, Patterson wanted to go to Nain too, but the, but the wind wouldn't let him. And he had, retained a, um, he had retained a pilot to take him to Nain. And Sims identifies that pilot as what, as he calls him, King, da uh, King Daniel of the Eskimos. That, that's, that, that's, that's how he described him. And Hans Roman uh, was good enough to look into the Moravian uh, records of Hopedale and was able to identify um, King Daniel of the Eskimos uh, and, um, and was able to indicate that, um, that he was uh, an, in an Inuk uh, by the name of King Mieralek. And Hans thinks that the fact that um, King Mieralek was part of his name might be why Sims was calling him King. Dan, you know, that, that's, uh, Daniel, of course, would be his, uh, his baptismal name. So, so there is certainly, certainly uh, indigenous people appear in the journals and in the court records, but not in the capacity of, of litigants or witnesses in the courts. So as far as I can see. So a question right here. Yeah, uh, Mr. Sims seems to be a very eloquent writer in the journals that you have. Uh, and I'm wondering, are these journals like a daily diary you yeah. and I would keep, or are they official documents no. for the court? No, they're, they're his private diary. So are they unique in that sense then? No. No. Uh, they, they aren't unique in the, in the sense, but I mean, the, 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 the iconic journal in Labrador is, is the journal of uh, Captain George Carver, oh, yeah. and that runs yeah. from 1770 to 1786. But I'm speaking with respect to the court. Oh, oh well, yeah. Yeah. that probably is unique. And John is right. I mean, you've got Carver, right? You've also got James, James, John James Audubon, who was on the coast in 1833, the very time uh, while, the Labrador, while the Labrador court was in Fort O, around there, um, John James Audubon was about 10 miles away in Rador, uh, Rador Bay is what it was called. And, uh, but the, unfortunately, because I hoped that they would, the two never connected. Uh, but, um, so you say, of course, you have John James Audubon's journals, which are quite good and beautifully written. Uh, but um, I'm not aware, yeah. which doesn't mean very much, I'm not aware of any others uh, from around about this time uh, other, than, other than George Sims. Uh, of course, Sims came from Birmingham. His father, I, don't, I tried hard to find out what his father did for a living, and I haven't sorted that one out yet. But I do know that um, in 1823, his father, uh, wrote to James Sims, who was George's brother. James was the Attorney General and later Supreme Court Judge. And old man Sims, William, wrote to his uh, son James a beautiful letter describing an encounter he had in his garden with a robin redbreast. And he wrote a poem about it. And the poem exists in our Rome's Provincial Archives, uh, and you can read it. It's quite dated poetry by, by 1823 standards, but nice to look at. And, um, and, um, so you can see that Sims probably came, in a fam came from a family where there was an appreciation for literature and culture. That's the sense I get. Uh, I would argue that, uh, that Captain George Cartwright's journal does have a significant legal aspect and, and that he in fact set himself up as, as the, the head of the Labrador um, divorce court in that he, he, he sat on the, uh, on the um, uh, divorce proceedings of his own common law relationship when he found that his uh, well, that his paramour was having an affair with one of his employees. He, he declared an annulment of their relationship right on the spot and he banished both of them from Labrador and, and saw that they... I don't think the Church of England would be... I don't think the Church of England would think it needed to annul a common law relationship. <laughs> but, but this was customary law. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, but uh, and I'll, I'll, I had one other thing to say about Cartwright. Cartwright, of course, was a resident of Labrador, and Cartwright at one point, and I, I made the argument in in the Discourse of Discovery book. I wrote an article on the comparison of it was called Comfic and and Captain George Cartwright comparison of uh, settler and Aboriginal law in in, uh, in the 18th century, and Cartwright and said at some point, because he was in the, in the milieu where there was a period of time when Labrador was under Newfoundland jurisdiction, then there was a period of time, was it 1774, uh, up until 1809, or ma and maybe the earlier days. Under Lower Canadian jurisdiction. Under Lower Canadian jurisdiction. Yeah, and, and then back, and, but, but Cartwright's residency period was 1786. 
close to the end of his, I think it was around the end of his, the time when he was in Labrador, he wrote uh, the Board of Trade and the Admiralty, people who were often uh, providing a huge amount of advice to the cabinet, and said that, forget about Quebec, they never show up on the coast of Labrador, and they cannot administer justice. And he also said, forget about St. John's. St. John's has done nothing for Labrador, and they, can, they can't respond in a timely way. He put forth a proposal that there should be a governor of Labrador. Let there be a government of its own. There's something like that. And, and he put himself forward as the candidate to be the governor of Labrador. And he wanted to have a left-handed governor, and he wanted to have a sheriff, and a jailer, and perhaps, perhaps he said, a chaplain. And, uh, yeah, so he, uh, but, and he needed a schooner, and he needed, uh, he needed a dozen men, or 18 men, to run, to run this thing. And so, I mean, in a way, he was being um, prescient. He was really looking to the future, well beyond the Labrador Court in 1826, 1833, perhaps closer to the time when I was sitting in Labrador as a resident judge, for my 11 years, and for the few, and, and, and the resident judges in Labrador doesn't go back very far, you know. It, I, I have been tracked it Judge Barnabal would know, uh, he, he's done uh, thumbnail sketches on all the judges, and uh, uh, most of the, the judges that were going up to Labrador were more like circuit judges, weren't they? Uh, up until around the time of Confederation, or? I knew the name, I'm forgetting now. Yeah, just, but, just but, to, but it's a very back, ephemeral kind of connection. Just to go back to this period that John mentioned, 1774 to 1809, it was an interesting, um, an interesting um, mode of government, and, and this is pointed out uh, in Dr. Stavely's book, um, uh, where Lower Canada had the government of Quebec, the civil government of Quebec, but the naval <coughs> governor in Newfoundland had responsibility for the fisheries protection and security of the whole coast. So your civil government of Labrador, uh, vested in, in Lower Canada, <coughs> naval protection came from St. John's. So that's an interesting dual um, uh, you know, form of, of government, I guess you could call it. Actually, when Carberry was saying that there should be a governor of, of uh, Labrador, he referred to the fact that, that, um, that even though the jurisdiction was held by Quebec, he basically said everybody forgot about that, and that the surrogate, the surrogate captains continued to, to administer justice on the coast of Labrador. Well, you know, when, when, when it's so remote uh, and it's difficult to do things, things can happen that, aren't, that don't necessarily go by the letter of the law. In the sessions records in these, in these uh, books here, uh, you'll find George Sims um, celebrating a marriage uh, in uh, Battle Harbor. Uh, uh, for for, um, for two residents, one from Ireland, one from England, I think. So he celebrated the marriage as justice of the peace, and he wrote in the marriage certificate there being no clergyman on the coast, and he, he married. Now, when you actually look at the laws that were in force in Newfoundland in 18, uh, in 1828 or 29, whenever he did that, around about that time, he had absolutely no legal authority to uh, to marry those two people. Um, once the, uh, once the Marriage Act of, um, I think it was 1825, came into force, only clergy marriages were recognized in Newfoundland and Labrador. Prior to 1825, yes, JP marriages were, were acceptable, and uh, sometimes marriages just by the, uh, by the principal person in the community, whoever that might be, somebody who would read, somebody who would remember that these people had made a promise, that sort of thing. However, <coughs> Sims did it, and he knew better. The witness, at the, the witness at the marriage was a William Dixon, the sheriff, who was a lawyer. So they, they knew. They knew what they were doing, but yet they did it. And why, I don't know. But, so when, when you're in such remote places and things need to be done, things get done. You know? we're, we're, uh, okay, uh, we're, it's 10 to 9 now, but we have a question. Very quick uh, question about contemporary situation. Did you, in your 11 years in Labrador, or other contemporary residents of this Journals that we might see at some point. Uh, that, that's, I'm going to keep that under advice. <laughs> <laughs> you may see something at some time in the future. Well, you have to wait 200 years. <laughs> <laughs> you may have to wait a while. All right, so we wrap this up. For listen, thank you so much. We're very patient. It's really, you know, an hour. And,